I know that this is a hard time to be doing more professional development when we have a million other things that are pressing that we want to be doing, like setting up Canvas. Um, so I have structured this presentation to be very tangible, practical, and quick. So I am going to be zipping through some problem, common problems with feedback systems and possible solutions, but I'm not going to be going into too much depth into the actual like um, implementation or the research that supports each of these strategies. So if you want that for any of them, just shout out and I can add more depth and detail. Um, and the sort of background of why I am giving this presentation like rather than somebody else is because um, feedback is something that I have spent a lot of time over the last three or four years learning about researching and designing tools for. And that comes from some work that I'm doing outside of school that started about three or four years ago with Elizabeth Matlick and then very quickly took on a life of its own. And now I help run a company called Floop, which builds um, a web-based feedback tool that acts as like a digital Dropbox, lets you give spot annotated feedback, audio feedback, have conversations around feedback. And one of my main jobs at Floop is as the research coordinator. So, um, so far we've had two sort of research partnerships. One was with an organization out of Kansas City called Lean Lab that just did really like a very brief efficacy study on the tool, but also the feedback practices that I'm gonna be sharing with you today. Um, and the outcomes of that showed that these feedback practices measurably increase student agency in your class, um, even just over the course of three months when the study was taking place. And then I just started a new research relationship this summer with um, Dr. Josh Wilson at the University of Delaware, and we're going to be studying teacher coaching messages, like feedback coaching messages, and how coaching teachers on better feedback practices can improve their teaching practice and therefore improve student outcomes. So there's also a lot of sort of cool stuff coming out in my future that I hope to share with you all too. So the structure of what I'm going to be doing in this talk is we're going to do a very quick overview of what effective feedback systems look like. And then I'm going to talk about the four most common feedback related problems that I see and hear about, um, like from all of you in conversation and other teachers. And those revolve around problems with time, with student engagement, with student compliance, and then with getting students to apply feedback information to their learning. And if we have time and we want to at the end, we can also start like brainstorming and troubleshooting with some of the other problems that you might have. We also could just end early if we end early. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. So feedback is something that had not gotten a ton of attention in research and literature until about maybe 15 years ago. Um, and then a ton of research started coming out and there was a large meta study that was done in Australia a couple of years ago that looked at 35 different interventions that could happen in a classroom and they ranked the effect size and the outcomes and um, found that feedback is the number one driver of student learning in the classroom. So above any other um, intervention that you can have in your class, feedback is the one that's going to give you the best bang for your buck. It's also one of the cheapest, quote unquote, both time and financially the cheapest. So essentially this slide tells you that we should care about feedback, right? Um, and then the research also tells us that there are some different pieces that go into having an effective feedback system. So the first one is the one you probably think about the most. It's actionable information. That means that students are getting feedback information at a time and in a form that is useful for them. Uh, the second dimension is agency to act. They need to actually be able to take that feedback and do something with it. They need to have a place and a time where that feedback information is relevant to their learning or work. And then they need to have feedback literacy, which is a set of skills that, teach, that allows them to seek, understand, and use that feedback to learn. And it's really not until we have all three of those dimensions in our classroom feedback system that we're actually gonna start to see those really good learning outcomes that the research has told us is possible. So one of the things I'm gonna ask you to sort of hold in your mind as you're hearing all these strategies is this sort of redefinition of feedback. Um, we 
we meaning my company has interviewed hundreds of teachers about their feedback practices and one of the most common patterns that we find is that they tend to define feedback like this that it's the information on how to improve it tells students what they need to do to get where they need to be which is like a pretty solid definition of feedback this is where i was at a couple of years ago of like it's the info and it's relevant to what they're learning about um but i encourage you to change your definition a little bit and start to see feedback as a process, um, which if you're a science teacher, you actually know that that's where the word feedback comes from, is that it should actually be a loop of feedback process. And in this case, it's the process in which learners make sense of information about their performance and use that information to enhance the quality of their work or learning strategies. So notice that this definition really puts a more active agency-based role on the student rather than the teacher, and it is much more ongoing rather than just like a one-time transmission of information. So problem number one that I hear from the most teachers across the world is I don't have time to give detailed feedback. And I think one of our privileges at Forest Ridge is that this might not actually be our biggest problem here, but it, you know, when you're giving like large end of semester essays, this is still a problem. Um, and the sort of root blocks behind this problem are there's like a motivational one and a cognitive one. The motivational one is around sort of your other instructional or assessment demands are either more pressing or more easily accomplished than giving feedback. I know that even as someone who's like really into feedback, I have times and Shelly can attest to this because I will sit in the office and be like, there are a hundred other things I would rather do than give feedback right now. I would rather clean my classroom. I would rather go home early. Like, and that's not because I don't care. That's because like giving feedback is hard. It takes a lot of my mental energy. And that leads to this other sort of block, the cognitive block where often I would realize my assessment tasks were really complex. There was a million things that I could give feedback about um, and I needed to figure out like what was the one that was the most important right now. So the broad category of solutions is to uh, design your assessments with feedback in mind. When you are sitting down to, to decide what your assessment is going to be, don't just think about like sort of backwards instructional design where you start with assessment and go back to instruction. You should think about start with assessment and feedback and then design your instruction. So sort of target it in. Um, and what this can look like is like try faster and focused teacher feedback hacks. So rubrics I know are something that you're all familiar with, but um, Mad Libs templates is another one that can be super effective. I don't have an example of that on here, but if you're all familiar with Mad Libs where you essentially like create a text template and you fill in the blanks when you're giving feedback. Um, another one is comment banks. So my product Floop has comment banks where you can just drag and drop feedback onto the page that you used before. Um, Google has added an add-in for Google Docs that lets you populate a comment bank. You can also just do this in OneNote, just like do a lot of copy pasting. Um, and the benefit of doing this beyond that it's faster is it forces you to think about the type of feedback that you're going to give before you start giving that feedback. So it also helps you focus in your feedback on the things that are actually important rather than going down that rabbit hole of like, ooh, I know this assessment isn't actually about like, I don't know, like this particular grammar thing, but I keep seeing it in the student work, so I'm going to comment on it anyways. Like, it helps you kind of stay on message. Um, and I want to throw kind of a controversial thought at you. I don't know how many of you have seen this article that came out recently called Rubrics in the Dehumanization of Education. Um, but this has been kind of blowing up on like edu Twitter right now, which you're lucky if you have not gone down the edu, edu Twitter rabbit hole, but it, there's also some good info in there. So I encourage you to rethink the way you use rubrics. And this doesn't mean get rid of them all together, but think about like rubric, just using rubrics isn't going to solve all your feedback problems. And there's a couple of reasons why. One is that rubrics really have two purposes. One is they are a scoring tool for teachers. They help us remove some of our assessment bias. They help us stay focused on the way that we're going to like score or assess a certain piece of work. 
And we also use them potentially as a learning tool for students, either as an aid for self-evaluation, or sometimes we use them to actually give feedback, right? We like highlight on the rubric and hand it back to the kid. Research, and I would guess some of your experience, shows us that rubrics are really not the best tool for feedback. There's a lot of cognitive overload there of asking a student to understand the information in a rubric. Um, and really the only time they work for feedback, either self-feedback or teacher feedback, is if you have heavily scaffolded the engagement process, like the process of them engaging with the criteria. You have shown them what each thing means, you've shown examples, you've done self-assessment that's guided. If you are just highlighting and handing a random rubric back to kids, you should assume that most of them will not understand the information you're trying to communicate to them. And that's regardless of age. Like this research was actually done in higher education. Um, worked examples, however, are a really great way to give feedback. And that can work both for like student internalized self-feedback um, it, when it's also scaffolded. So essentially like you can't just give it to them. You have to help them understand the information in that. Um, when you do worked examples, and I would also say thinking about guided peer review and notice that I say guided, like it needs to be focused around a criteria. You need to be helping them give the type of feedback that's productive. Um, but worked examples and guided peer review are really cool, not just for saving you time, right? You can do worked examples with your whole class. You can do a guided peer review in class where every kid's getting feedback and you just were guiding it rather than giving all that feedback. What it does is it starts to build students' ability to internalize the feedback process. So with, with like peer feedback, the benefit isn't really so much that every kid is getting a bunch of feedback from their peers. It's rather that each student is getting to compare their work to the work of multiple other students. Um, and in doing so, they're essentially doing their own worked example. They're comparing their work to others, or in the case of a worked example, which is everyone familiar with what I'm talking about when I say worked example, where you like throw a piece of student work up on the board and like work through evaluating it together. Okay, so when you do that, students are internally saying, oh, if that work is like that, and my teacher said that about it, can I generalize that to my work and what my teacher might say about my work? So you're teaching them this like, sort of metacognitive self-talk that helps them evaluate their own work. Um, okay, so feedback problem number two is around engagement. And so this might sound like I spend all this time giving feedback and the kids aren't even reading it, which was a huge problem in my science class a number of years ago. Um, and the blocks that students are most likely to come up against that leads to them not reading feedback are either motivational or cognitive. So the motivational one is that they don't see the worth or the value of reading the feedback. And the other is that cognitively or maybe even logistically, they can't access it. Like they just don't, either you've given them the super complex rubric and they can't understand it, or they literally don't know how to log on to Canvas, or they don't know that they're supposed to click the little speech bubble to see that there's feedback there, right? So your job as a teacher in this case is to invite them, either literally or metaphorically, to engage with the feedback in some way. Um, so here's one of my favorite slides that I ever throw into any presentation. And I think a lot of you have seen this before, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. But essentially, when you give grades, you stop the conversation. Grades are a period. That's it, right? So you give a grade or you give comments only, the research says you're gonna get significantly better performance increases when you give comments only. And if you give a grade with comments, the research says we see very little performance improvement, which means what your grade has done is essentially covered up the comment that you gave and said like, eh, it's here, but I don't really care if you use this information or not. So uh, the re there's actually some brand new research that's just come out this summer that also shows that learning management systems make this problem even worse. So essentially, and Canvas is no better than Veracross at this, by the way, that when you post a grade on the LMS, the grade shows by default. And the student has to, in the case of Canvas, click multiple times to get any feedback to show up. 
which means that the grades and the feedback are literally spatially separated um, in a way that then they're not like students are not associating that feedback with any sort of like meaningful reason to engage with that work. So just sort of think about that as you're deciding the sequence of when you give feedback and when you give grades. Um, another one I've mentioned a couple times is think about just simplifying the way you present feedback. So like ask yourself, do I have rubrics that look like this one on the left? Like, do I have rubrics that have, even if it's just a part of this, right? Like descriptions for every level or like different descriptions stacked on top of each other. So you have different rows. This type of rubric is great for reducing bias in your grading. This is a teacher tool. This is not a student tool. Thinking about going towards something maybe like a single point rubric for actually communicating feedback back to students, that's a better student tool because you're reducing cognitive load on the student when it's time for them to process their feedback. And then another one, this is probably my absolute favorite strategy of all the strategies I'm going to present today is ask your students questions and give them time to respond in class. So in your feedback, you can literally, instead of saying like, this is wrong, try this instead, right? Instead of giving what we call a directive piece of feedback, you can just reframe that exact feedback as a question, right? How confident are you in this answer? Where did you find this response? And can you double check its accuracy? Um, my favorite one in math is just, what's your mistake here? right? Like that highlighting mistake sort of thing. But also recognize that just asking them a question isn't enough to get them to answer it. You need to give them some structure around that. So in the UK, they have this amazing new thing that's happening in a lot of their schools called DIRT, which is dedicated improvement and reflection time. And it's essentially a specific way of structuring like advisory time or like homeroom time. But they teach every student in the school a system for accessing their grades and feedback, processing it, coming up with a revision plan, going to their teacher and communicating the revision plan and turning stuff in. And when you give students both a process and time, they are significantly more likely to engage with your feedback and use it for meaningful revision. So if you're gonna do any of the strategies, I would recommend trying this one first because it's like very low lift. So, Problem number three, I think is the one that I hear the most often, and I actually have the hardest time coming up with a really solid solution for it, but I'm gonna try today. So this one is, if I don't grade it, they're not gonna do it. If I don't grade X sort of assignment, whether it's the revision or the final or a discussion or homework or whatever, students aren't gonna do it. Um, there's two sort of blocks, a motivational and a cognitive block to why students might not do ungraded work. One is that they don't see the value in doing the work, right? You have created, or we, I should say we, as teachers, as a global education system, have created a system of um, transactional learning, right? I did this work, you give me the grade. And that means, why would they do work if they're not getting paid for it, right? Which is fair, that's a fair question. Um, the other one, it sounds similar, but the cognitive block, they don't see the purpose in the work you're asking them to do. So you've asked them to write a paper, and then you've asked them to revise the paper and turn the paper in again. But Ms. Witcher, I already wrote the paper. I did the work. Give me the grade, right? So helping them see that there is both worth and value or purpose and value in the work that you're asking them to do. Um, and frankly, like make it worthwhile, make it worthwhile for them to apply the feedback to revision or future work. So here's some ways to do that. Um, one is by incentivizing and scaffolding revision. So the way that I used to give narrative feedback in Veracross was I would give sort of summative, and that's in quotes because they can do revision, summative feedback at the top. It's descriptively telling them what level they're at and why. I suggest some next steps. So, hey, nice work. Next, you should probably try this. And then I make it super easy for them to start working on revisions. So in this case, I link to a guided game planning um, Google form where they just fill in like, here's the grade I got, here's what that means, here's how I'm planning on continuing to work on this, and here's the date that I'm setting for myself to turn it in. 
so I kind of structure that leading to the next steps and I've given them a purpose like um, and the value in this case of them doing revisions and resubmitting is I will increase their grade if they do better. So I am sort of essentially paying them for the work that they're doing within our transactional grade system. Um, another way to do this to help them sort of see the, the purpose of feedback or revision is to design opportunities for students to use the feedback soon. And a couple ways you might do that. One is assignment sprints. So that's where you have three or more assignments with the same goals and grading criteria. So that might be like single paragraph argument writing where you do one, you get feedback, you do another the next week, you get feedback, and then you do the third one and the third one is graded, right? So you're showing and you tell them ahead of time, we're gonna do three of these, okay? Another might be micro assignments. So you take a more complex, like larger project and you break it down into checkpoints, but make e each of those checkpoints focused on just a single criteria. So you're gonna say like, first we're gonna work on our essay and we're gonna focus on just getting the sequence of our ideas down, right? And you're gonna get feedback on that. Now we're gonna do the part of our essay that focuses on I don't know, like complex vocabulary usage or academic vocabulary. And then you get feedback on that. And you're actually maybe taking a complex rubric and they're getting a grade on each part as they go, knowing that they then can revise and increase the grade along the way. So you, you're essentially saying like, here's where you're at right now. You can work and earn a better grade by using the feedback that I'm giving you along the way. Um, ideally, by the way, we would move towards a system where we're not having to use grades as a carrot to get students to do work, but I'm trying to be practical here and say that's the system we're operating within. So this is what that might look like until we get to that utopian world where we don't need grades to get them to do work. And then finally, feedback portfolios. So every time you give a student an assignment and it produces a piece of feedback, whether it's peer or self or teacher, you ask them to take that feedback and put it into some sort of well formatted holding pen and that might be a one note notebook that might be a physical notebook it might be something in canvas if we can figure that out and the idea is that then you're going to do activities in class regularly that help them analyze their feedback and look for patterns right and that might be used for goal setting that might be used for uh, student-led conferences that might be used for um providing some sort of document to teachers when they when you are asked as a teacher to do a college recommendation um so like essentially collecting all that information in one place okay and then our fourth pro problem is around application and this is probably one of the most complex ones and it is students or a student i can think of a few in my head are making the same mistake over and over again so I know that they're reading their feedback, we talk about it, we have little conferences to make sure they understand it, and then they make the same mistake again. And there's a couple of reasons, and these are actually pretty like distinct reasons, they're usually separate, like a student either has one of the problems or the other. Um, the first is an emotional block, they don't want to face their mistake. They don't want to internalize that they are making a mistake, they don't want to have to address it, they want to just pretend it's not happening. And then the other is a more cognitive block. They don't know how to act on the feedback. So they might be able to articulate. And this one, by the way, I like keep drawing so many connections back to the Sarah Ward conversations that we've had around like, okay, they wrote down on their to-do list, like fix spelling mistakes in whatever S Lewis and Clark essay. And they sat down to do it and they didn't correct any spelling mistakes. Like, and that might be that they know the words of what they're supposed to do, they don't know what it looks like in action, right? And so the goal here is to turn feedback from a transmission into a dialogue, have it be a conversation. Okay. Um, oh, this one has a video and I'm like, we'll see if it's easy for me to play it for you. If it's not, we're gonna skip it and I'll describe it. But um, one of the first things you can do to tackle the emotional block of feedback is to be a little vulnerable yourself. So modeling what the research calls open recipients to feedback. So what that often looks like is you are seeking feedback from your students 
you are processing that feedback publicly and you are showing them how you use that feedback to inform your pedagogy. And this is super hard, by the way, maybe not something to tackle here at the beginning of the year, but something to hold in your head. And that might mean like shifting your, and I think we've done this already as a school, like shifting your end of course surveys to the middle of the year or the middle of the semester. And then like reading them and processing them yourself first, but then sharing with your students like, hey, you told me that this part of the course wasn't working for you. Here's my game plan for how I'm going to improve on that. Right. So showing them that you are a lifelong learner, you are processing feedback and also just be super open with them that it's hard. Right. Like you guys told me this about my teaching. I had to take a couple days to be upset about that. Right. Because I took that personally at first and now I've found some space and time I've thought about it and I agree that's something I can work on. Here's what I'm going to do to work on that. So showing them that you're also learning. I'm going to hit play and see if you can hear this. If you can hear the sound, will you give me a thumbs up? Oh, bummer. Okay. We'll just skip it. So essentially what this is, is this is a, a teacher in Kansas City, Adam, who teaches AP English. And the video is him doing that. It's him explaining before he gives a course survey why he's giving the course survey um, and pushing his students to give really constructive feedback rather than just being like, we like you, Adam, you're great, you're a good teacher. So um, if you wanna see the video, let me know. I'll, I'll see if I can share it later. Um, another thing that you can do to help students be more both cognitively and motivationally open to feedback is require students to ask for the feedback they want. And this one is such a powerful strategy for two reasons. One is that we are much more likely to listen to feedback that we asked for, right? Like think about walking into your classroom or I don't know, like some professional learning community and you sit down and it's time for you to be in the hot chair or whatever and like get some feedback and everyone is like i don't like your shirt today i don't think that's a work appropriate shirt right you'd be like excuse me like that is not what we're talking about right now that was not what you walked in the door expecting that was not the feedback you wanted you wanted feedback on your i don't know like content delivery or something like that so when we ask for feedback we are much more likely to actually want to hear the answer right and then the second thing that asking, having students ask for feedback is valuable for is that when they ask for it, they have already thought about how they're gonna use it, right? So that means when the feedback arrives, it's valuable to them. They have some place in mind where they're gonna use it. So what I will do is I will have students turn rough drafts in, and this is a screen snip of, of a student turning some work in on Floop. And what I tell them is like, write your paragraph, whatever, do your work. And then at the bottom, I want you to look at the grading rubric and I want you to pick just one or two things from the rubric that you want to continue to work on in your next draft. And I want you to formulate a question about that that I can answer. And then the other nice thing that this does is now I am not responsible for the quality of their work anymore, right? Like, you know that situation where kids will turn in work and you will give them feedback and hand it back and they will do revisions and turn it in and then they won't get a mastery level. And they're like, but Ms. Witcher, why didn't you mention that other criteria in my feedback? And I'm like, cause I'm not the one doing the learning, right? Like, so what it does is it also lets you off the hook to focus on just one thing, the thing the student asked about without relinquishing the responsibility of the student to actually continue to evaluate the quality of the rest of the criteria and continue to work on the rest of the, the stuff. So um, this is also a really low lift, easy one for you to put into place pretty quickly. Um, and then here is my big strategy to sum everything up that I want you to really think about whenever you are deciding which of these strategies to try, how you're going to get feedback on any given assignment. And that is ask yourself, who is doing the thinking with the strategy that I am using? So when we sit down with student math homework, an essay that they wrote, a presentation that they're about to give that you watched as a rough draft, right? And all you're giving them is corrections, right? You're writing that like awkward, you're circling spelling mistakes, you're adding commas in, you're drawing negative signs when they lost a negative sign. You, the teacher, are doing 99% of the thinking. And all the student has to do is the 1% effort of just copying what you told them to change, right? 
grades are pretty similar. They're just a little bit further up towards student thinking, but not much. When you give a grade, you have made sense of the rubric, you have evaluated the student work, you have decided what score is fair. All the student has to do is passively receive that grade. That's it, not a lot of thinking is done. Rubrics are about 50-50, depending on how you use them. Students might do some thinking if you've given them a reason to, or if they're doing self-assessment, but you're doing a lot of the thinking by building the rubric, right? Um, and further up towards student thinking are the ones where the students are really doing most of the work. So um, students asking for feedback in the form of questions, or you as a teacher asking them a feedback question and requiring them to respond, lots of student thinking happening there. Um, worked examples, as long as you are structuring the class doing a lot of the evaluation, or as long as you're having the students evaluate each other's work, those are pretty student heavy. Um, the absolute best one, honestly, is guided peer review. You might pick the criteria and give them some sentence stems, but they are doing all of the evaluating and thinking. Um, I recognize that guided peer review and like exemplars and stuff are not something that you can do with every assignment every time but questions probably are, right? If you're giving feedback on something, asking them a question is a pretty easy way to give feedback. Um, so I would encourage you as much as possible to be on the student thinking end when you're giving feedback. Alrighty, here's our summary. You have access to all of these slides. Um, I was way quicker than I thought I was 